morning, church. Good morning. Uh, it's interesting how so many of the testimonies tied together. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I was battling myself whether I should tell my car story too. <laughs> <laughs> is trying to speak to us in many ways. And uh, I woke up about 4 o'clock this morning after um, reviewing my presentation. And I'm saying, I have a long day ahead of me. I, I need to sleep maybe at least another hour and a half, two hours. <laughs> I couldn't go back to sleep and turn on some really, really nice um, instrumental music, and I still didn't fall asleep until about 6 o'clock. I slept for another hour. And it was not until I was about, um, about half an hour behind that it was like the voice of God said, do you know why you woke up now? <laughs> And I said, yeah, because I didn't need to be hurrying this morning of all mornings. <laughs> and uh, 14 minutes, I needed to get here early to try to see if the internet would work. It's not working, but because I told Sister Cooler that she would be able to view the, uh, the, the Sabbath school um, via Zoom. And here I am, 14 minutes to get to church, and it takes uh, about 15, 16 minutes to get here, and I'm, I'm driving, trying to ride, drive the speed limit. I haven't had a ticket in about seven years, and I pledge to God I will never have another one. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm saying, you can't get a ticket this morning. <laughs> <laughs> uh, not this morning, and I drove quietly, gently. Got here nearly five minutes late, but I want to thank God because he's trying to speak to us. Yes. And I, I've made a pledge that I'm not going to, I don't like to do sermons anymore because I think mostly when we do sermons, people go away with the emotions and they don't remember a thing you say. That's right. That's right. So I'm switching to kind of a teaching Bible study approach. And, um, but anyway, I made the pledge that when I speak, I'm trying to submit to God to do something that I believe he's asking me to do Amen. or behave in a certain way that I believe he's asking me to do. So this, today we are going to do a Bible study. So I want you to, to, um, to get your Bible in hands. And if you have a pen and you have your bulletin, write these texts text down so that you can review them yourself and make a decision about what they mean. So please do that. Um, before we, 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 we go into the study, 268 is a, I'm going to read the first verse of, I'll uh, try to sing it, 268 from the hymnal. And, um, Holy Spirit, light divine, shine upon this heart of mine. Chase the shades of night away, turn my darkness into day. That is my prayer. I hope it is your prayer also. Amen. That this Holy Spirit, who wants to be our companion, will dispel darkness. I see two sisters here, and I'm thinking, I hope it doesn't disturb you too much if I were to ask you um, your name. John Kaitadon. John? Clay? Kaitadon. Kaitadon. Okay. And? 
Luisa Illich. Luisa Illich. 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 Very good. Thank you for coming. And I hope this will be the first of many times. And you will find this uh, a blessing. Um, I just want to say, when I do my testimony, I want to acknowledge them. I forgot. Okay. It's my memory. There are two of my good friends from Mount Olive. Ah. That, um, and I was just that was okay. invited to come today. Wonderful. That's what happened today. Wonderful. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Okay. So our study, I'd like you to read some of these verses when I, when I um, name them, call them. Uh, in 1 John, these I'm going to go through because we know them. 1 John chapter 4, verse 8. It says, God is love. You remember that? Amen. God is love. Since God is love, everything he does is loving. It has to be. Even when he's angry, it has to be loving. Because that's who he is. God is love. It also means that when he created, when God created, he was loving. 1 John chapter 4, verse 18, we know that very well too. Uh, does anybody remember what it, what it says? 1 John 4, 18, there is no fear in love because, per but perfect love casts out fear because fear torments. He that fears is not made perfect in love. If I'm afraid in any way, unnecessarily, because there's some fear that is healthy. Fear of fire uh, for a child is healthy. But as we get older, those fears are supposed to disappear as the love of God takes hold upon our hearts. Now, 1 John, same book, chapter 2, Verse 4, someone read that for me, please. First John chapter 2, verse 4. If you, if you can find it quickly. He that says, I know him, he keepeth not his commandments, there's a liar, and the truth is not in him. And verse 5. Verse 5. For who keepeth his word in him, verily is the love of God perfected. Hereby I know we are, we that we are in him. So we are. In him and love is made perfect simply by doing what he says. Do you see that? Yes. Perfect love is not some magic formula that you and I are trying to discover. It's simply doing what God says. Agreed? Yes. yes. So the principle of love is right doing. The character of love is self-denial which amounts to giving. If I'm denying myself, I'm giving to someone else, at least God. That's the, that's the character of love. Acts chapter 20, verse 35. Someone, as soon as you find it, can you read it, please? Acts chapter 20, verse 35. I showed you all things, how that thou so labored be ought support the week and to fix it. Remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. I kind of puzzled over that for a long time. Why is it more blessed to give than to receive? And then after really, work, I was working with a client and as I'm going along, as a Christian, I, I'm trying to convince her that um, this self-focus is not healthy. And other focus is what's going to help her move away from what she's facing. And then the thought came to me that the reason it is more blessed to give than to receive is that the giver is already blessed and giving is trying to make someone blessed 
Therefore, the giver is always more blessed than the receiver. Because that's where it starts. Do you, do you see that? It's more blessed to give than to receive. But that's not natural human nature, is it? No. no. And that is where sin comes in. Because the character of sin, violation of the law, ignoring God, doubting God, distrusting God, is what the devil practices. The character of sin is wrongdoing without repentance, aiming primarily to get, to keep, to hoard. It's about self primarily, and it shows that some doubt or fear exists in the heart of that person. That is sin. Doubt, fear, distrust. So, what is Satan's scheme to destroy love? Which is what God created when he created the world. Created human beings. What is his scheme? Turn to Genesis chapter 3 verses 9 through 11. And see if you can identify his scheme. Genesis chapter 3, chapter... 3, 9 to 11. And someone read it, please. And the Lord called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid, because I was naked, and I hid myself. And he said, Who told thee that thou wast naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree, whereof I commanded thee that thou shouldest not eat? Okay, now go back up to verses 2 through 5. And we're going to put those together. Verses, same chapter, verses 2 through 5. So go ahead. Okay. And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, We shall not eat of it, neither shall we touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall see, ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. So what are the ingredients of Satan's strategy to destroy love in the earth and in human beings? What are some of the things you see? Doubt. Doubt. Fear. Fear. Is also there. Distrust. Mm -hmm. These are the elements. They are critical for him to get uh, through to us. Wanting something more. Wanting to get something more. The desire for more. Particularly the desire for more that God does not give. It is his approach. It is still his approach. Discontent. Discontent. Not being satisfied with what God has given. So we are either trying to get or we are determined to hoard. COVID and hoarding. Do you remember? Piles upon piles of toilet paper. As if God doesn't provide. We were all part of it, right? Yes. May God, no, brother says no. <laughs> Only sister. <laughs> I got it for <laughs> He was part of it too. <laughs> Hoarding is anti love. Because in the hoarding is fear and distrust. The system may not look like it can provide it, but. God surely can. Amen. 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 Yes. So, doubt, fear, distrust, a focus on getting apart from God. Eve wanted more knowledge, but not from God. More wisdom, but she was looking for it from the fruit. 
Adam was afraid to lose Eve, he didn't see that Eve was safe trusting God. So he ate the fruit, and both of them ended up distrusting God's method. Fear. Doubt. Distrust. It is the same thing today. Because God is making some promises to us, and because we have, you name them, illness, financial issues, a target for retirement, hello? <laughs> there are some things we are afraid to do even though we know that God is asking us to do them. It is the devil's way. What is the first step in restoring the love that Adam and Eve gave up? John 3, 16, can we repeat it together? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Someone turn also to 1 John chapter 2, verse 2. First John chapter 2, I have four there, Brother Rena, but it's 2, verse 2. Just as John 3.16, for God so loved the world, it says he is the propitiation, the substitute for the whole world. Do you realize that God, Jesus has forgiven the sins of the whole world? Every single human has had his or her sins forgiven. What that says to us is we don't have to wait for someone to say sorry to forgive. Am I correct? We don't have to wait. We forgive because we are in love with God. And God empowers us to offer a gift because we are in the mode of giving. Whether they want it or not. How they respond is, is, is up to them. What is achieved then when the sacrifice of Christ is accepted by the believer because he offers it to the whole world? Someone turn to, or all, let us all turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 to 11. 1 Corinthians 6, 9 to 11. And I warn you, this is going to be a little scary. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 to 11. Someone read, please. First, so what is achieved when the sacrifice of Christ is accepted by believers? Do you not know that the unrighteousness, the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do you not, do you not be deceived? Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, not adulterers, not homosexuals, not sodomites, not thieves, not covetous, not drunkards, not revilers, 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 not extortionists, will inherit the kingdom of God. And verse 11. And such were some of you, but you were washed, but you were sanctified, wow. but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Amen. So Paul lists a very good long list of examples of sinners or what sinners do. And then he lists in verse 11 some of us. All of those who were in his hearing, by the way. All those who had repented. He said, you were like that, but not now. So Let's go with an equation. And if you disagree, fine. But let's try an equation. Washed plus sanctified plus 
justified, equal, Forgiveness. holy, what else? Plus, righteous, righteous plus, perfect. Perfect. <laughs> but I'm going to put a, 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 an element there that is a little more provocative, Elder. Sinless. That's right. Come on now. Let's go over that equation again. Washed, sanctified, justified, equal, holy, plus righteous, plus sinless. Don't agree? Hold your, your, your answer. This is where many hop off the cart of Christianity. Because doubt and disbelief, fear about whether or not it can be kept going, creep in. How can I be declared sinless? No human of himself or herself is ever declared sinless. No human for that matter is declared sanctified, washed, justified. But if you are washed, if you are sanctified, if you are Justified, where is the sin? <clears throat> Jesus said on the cross, it is finished. I've done everything. I've taken care of the sin issue. And if you believe it, it is finished. Amen. Amen. Finished. Yes. The work is done. How was this equation how was this equation achieved by the way? How was it? Let's turn to, we know it from the death of Christ, but a little more details. First, 2 Corinthians 5 verse 21. And let's see if we can get some clarification. 5 verse 21. For he had made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made righteous of God in him. He was made what? Sin for us. Sin. So I want you to, on your bulletin, wherever you're making note, draw a circle. Draw a circle. We're going to come back to it. And let's put one cross there for you in that circle. One cross for you in that circle. That's you and sin. Where are you now when you accept Christ? In Christ. Because he became sin for you. Therefore, when you are accepting and you get into him, your sin, gone, taken into him, and that's what was nailed to the cross also. Amen. Your sins and mine. Going to expand a little bit. Turn to Galatians 3.14. It, it expands it a little more. Galatians chapter 3 verse 14. Why did I pick the cross? Can someone read please? Galatians 3.14. Okay, go back up to 13 for me, please. Go ahead, Elder. Ah. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on the tree. Okay, so Abraham got the blessing, but it came from Jesus being considered cursed. And what is cursed or sin? The cross. The symbol of being cursed or being considered sin is the cross. So you understand why that one cross is in Jesus? Because that's you. Now, since he died for the whole world, how many cross should be in that circle? Billions. Billions. 
millions and so fill the circle with some crosses quickly please put as many crosses that you can we used to use the word crosses differently you don't know about that anyway put some crosses in that circle because it is a symbol of sin and since Jesus became sin for us we by faith went into him while he was on the cross he took us there in fact he said I don't even need your permission to take you into me because said this before the first Adam didn't ask your permission to take you into sin did he he didn't ask your permission to give you death and suffering did he no Jesus said I can do the same thing as the second Adam but the opposite I can take you into me with your sins and I can die with you in me with your sins amen, amen. he could because he earned it by dying on the cross so the circle is filled with the sins of yours and mine and everyone else he took everybody to him how do I know John chapter 12 verse 32 someone read it please John chapter 12 verse 32 what does it say John 12 32 and if I be lifted up from the earth I will draw all men unto me and I if I be lifted up will draw all men unto me or into me don't need your permission. I, the sacrifice for the sins of the world, will, if I am put on a cross, I will take all men into me with their sins. Did he do it? Yeah. Absolutely. So what does, does that mean that everyone in the world is righteous, cleansed? No. 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 He could take two steps. Cross, grave without your permission but there is one step he needs your permission to complete and what is that one resurrection. resurrection let's look at Romans chapter 6 verses 4 and 5 Romans chapter 6 verses 4 and 5 and if you find it read it please Amen. So we must choose to be resurrected with him. And that's what baptism is about. We say we died with him. And when we are raised, we say we came from the grave with him through resurrection. And that means my sins were left in the cross. Amen. Thought you'd be a little more excited. My sins, your sins were left in the cross. So there are two, only two sets of people. The resurrected or those alive or they still buried in the grave. Still with their sins. Mm -hmm. Only two groups. Amen. So what you have in this world, the real living and the dead walking. Amen. The walking dead. Only two groups, real people, alive people who rose with Christ by faith, walking jubilantly, excited, without fear. Without distrust, without doubt. Because perfect love means doing what God says we should do. I thank him that he gives a little pathway for those of us who fail from time to time like this morning. <laughs> Just because you sin 
every now and again doesn't mean that you're dead. Come on. Amen. <laughs> Amen. It doesn't mean that you're still in the grave. It simply means that Jesus said, I took that sin to the grave, that one also. Therefore, you don't have to worry about it beyond repentance. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. I am so excited for Jesus. Yes. And I'm sorry, folks. I'm also excited for me. <laughs> because I believe with all my heart that as a result of the sacrifice of Christ, I shall be saved. Amen. Just as I am. I hope you're excited too. What authority did Jesus earn? What authority did he earn when he did all of this, dying with me, taking me to the grave by faith, and then accepting my pledge of belief, coming from the grave with me? What authority did he gain? Isaiah chapter 53. I'm talking about us living above fear, my dear friends, brothers and sisters, because it is a miserable life <clears throat> talked to a, one of my clients this week and she told me how as a teenager she used to come home from school and how they would gingerly eggshell like check out the scene to see if their mom was angry or not because they knew if she was angry oh my terror would be let loose on them You all grew up with nice parents, so you don't know anything about being beaten for the wrong reason. <laughs> beaten for the wrong reason. So, Isaiah 53, verses three, uh, verse 4. And someone turned to Matthew 8, 16, and 17 also. So, Isaiah 53, verse 4. What does it say? Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet... We esteem him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. What did he bear for us? Our griefs, our Sorrow. sorrows. Yes. And we know our sins. Mm -hmm. So, Brother Peters, when you look at your suffering wife, yes, what can you hang on to? Jesus yes. bore that grief for my, my wife. Therefore, it will never be as painful as it should be, even though she's suffering. Amen. Do you understand that, folks? Yes. Yes. My sorrows, my disappointments, Jesus took all of it to the cross and buried it in the grave. And what he allows, he allows only the amount that we can bear or that which he knows will make us ready for the kingdom. Amen. 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 Praise God. Praise the Lord. Yes. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Yes. Thank you, Lord. Do you want to see how this is fulfilled? Turn, as I said, to Matthew chapter 8. And see how Jesus, even though he had not yet died, how he said, because I'm the lamb slain from the foundation of the world, I'm going to show you what my death authorizes me to do. Chapter 8, verses 16 and 17 of Matthew. Someone read it, please. When even had come, they brought to him men who were demon-possessed, and they cast out the spirit with a word, and healed all who were sick, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, He himself took our infirmities and bore our sickness. Do you understand, folks? Yes. He says, I'm going to show you what this means. I have the authority. I'm going to heal sickness. I'm going to heal diseases. I, in fact, will preach the gospel because I'm authorized by my death. The 
But there's a point that we Christians need to remember. By accepting Christ, we also give him permission to manage us. That means if you don't do silly things contrary to his words, he will he may allow diseases to go longer than they should. Yes. Normally. He's managing. So, I mean, with audacity, say, don't prolong your mourning over suffering. Thank you. Tell God it is painful. But after a while, get up and rejoice in the pain. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Because you gave him permission to manage your pain yes. or your disease or no disease at all. Yes. How often did Jesus died, my friends and brothers and sisters. How often did he die? Every day? Was it? He died once. And if you can't remember anything, remember, Moses didn't go into the promised land because he struck the rock how many times? Twice. And we know the scripture says, Spirit of Prophecy bears it out too, that since Christ was going to die just once, the rock needed to be struck how many times? Once. So, God is depending on us to stop behaving as if Jesus needs to die again to make us happy. <laughs> Hebrews chapter 8. Hebrews chapter... I'm talking to myself here, brothers, because, you know, I had said to God about... Eight years ago. I said to God, God, if you allow me to get X amount from Social Security... I shall retire. <laughs> and Sister Israel, I got it a few years back. And I'm still killing myself. <laughs> Why? Doubt and fear of the provision of Jesus. As if it's social security that's going to guarantee me for the rest of my life. And I'm talking about when God has something that he needs you to do, but you're aching and suffering so much that it is preventing you from doing it. What does Hebrews chapter um, 8.28 say? So scripture read it. 8.28. I'm sorry, it is 9.28. 9.28. Yes. So Christ was offered once to, he, to bear the sins of many. To those who eagerly wait for him, he will appear a second time apart from sin or salvation. Now, the misunderstanding has gone on for a long time because Eve misunderstood God. And I'm saying misunderstanding is not like you said something that someone is misunderstanding. Someone is simply mistrusting God. So that's the misunderstanding. Adam, Eve did it. Adam did it. And we are continuing the same thing. Misunderstanding God. Because the moment you say to particularly Seventh-day Adventists that Christ died once and he took all your sins most of us start worrying about one save all, all saved. <laughs> As if God doesn't know what he's doing. Or is it that I'm seeing something that is not in the Bible? 
So he died once, which means he took the sins of every human being from Adam until the earth will be destroyed. Is that true? Yes. So let, let's look at it. If you look at chapter, uh, verses 25 and 26, it will tell you that if Jesus needed to die more than once, he would have had to be dying since the Adam and Eve sin. But you can read that when you get home. Well, let's look at, look at the, the idea. Many millions lived during the time of Christ. The time he was crucified. Were their sins taken care of when he died? Yes. 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 Am I correct? Yes. Turn to Micah chapter 7 verse 19. Micah 7 19. If you find it, you can read it. Or if it's on the screen, 719. He will turn again. He will have compassion upon us. He will, he will subdue our infirmities. And, go, and thou will pass all their sins into the depth of the sea. So that is the present, right? Yeah. He will cast it into the depths of the sea. He's talking about the present. Once you confess it, he has taken care of it already, but now you confess it, you get the benefit. That's a big difference. Forgiven all, but who gets the benefit? Those who repent, confess, and repent. That is taking care of the present. So those alive when he died. How about... Actually, that is taking care of the past. Those who were alive when he died... 1 John chapter 1 verse 9 the present so cast them in the sea it's talking about those who were already dead that they had already been forgiven even though not all of them got the benefit because not all accepted 1 John 1 verse 9 what does it say if we confess our sins he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That is the present. Amen. Amen. So he took care of the past. We know that. We know he took care of the present. How about the future? This is an amazing reason why we should stop worrying and start living. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. There are more than 7 billion people alive today. Am I correct? More than 7. Jesus died more than 2,000 years ago. Did he take care of the sins of the people of today? Which is future for him. Yes. Did he? Yes. Absolutely. Amen. John 12 verse 32. We have said it. We said it earlier. John 12, 32 says, And I, if I be lifted up, shall draw all men unto me. Does it, doesn't it look like he's saying even those to come? Yes. Yes. yes, sir. Even those to come will be in me. Past, present, and future. Amen. Praise God. Do you understand why he could say it is finished, taken care of everything, it's now up to you. So don't let the fear of one saved, always saved, bother you. Because God knows that those who are truly converted will continue to choose him. And if you don't believe me, the Bible says, if it were possible for the very elect, they would be deceived. He knows those who are committed. And he knows also that you always have the freedom of choice. You can choose to walk away from God any day you want. But he knows the committed ones. In fact, he looked at David, I'm amazed, and he said of David, his heart was perfectly committed to me. 
for a man who did such a wicked thing or several wicked things actually for God to say his heart was always per perfect towards me is amazing what it means is that God knew that David even though he committed folly and, and serious offenses knew that there was nothing that was going to take him permanently from God totally committed totally committed and I'm wondering why is it that we insist on not accepting all that God is offering why finally Matthew chapter 6 we know it very well. Matthew chapter 6. This is all he says. Verses 31 to 33. Let's go from 31. Go ahead and read please. Therefore take no thought saying what shall we eat or what shall we drink or wherewithal shall we be clothed? This is a question when you are confronted with possibly negative consequences compared to the request for God for you to do something, of God for you to do something. Don't worry about it even though you can't see the next step. I say go forward. God is expecting us to move. Verse 32. For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knoweth that what you have need of, that you have need of all these things. Wow. All these things. You look like a Gentile. <laughs> worrying about. Hey. I say get the job done and you're saying but God sister brother stop looking like a Gentile stop behaving as if you never met me stop behaving as if I never led you and now let's close the deal verse 33 but Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. So the question is whether or not you know that the equation very well, and I have accepted it. Do you? Do I know the equation? Cleansed, sanctified, justified, equal, sinless, righteous, holy? Do we know that equation? Do we accept it? Because he says, if you have the kingdom. <laughs> yes, sister uh, Jordan, if you and I have the kingdom, all things are guaranteed. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Amen. I hope we're not saying we don't have the kingdom. May the Lord have mercy on us. Those of you who want God to confirm the kingdom in you, please stand. You want God to confirm the kingdom in you. And you want to embrace this equation complete in Christ. Complete because of the grace of God. Future guaranteed. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for what you've done for us. Thank you, oh God, that we can walk by faith and walk confidently. Amen. Oh God, may we not falter. May the world see committed, committed Christians by the way we live.
In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. Amen. Please remain standing.